people used to tr- trust Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with their valuables, although they were opposing him. Many of them they will not come openly to speak in his favor, but in their hearts they all knew that he is a sadiq and he is an amin. He is the most truthful and the most trustworthy person in Makkah. We cannot find more trustworthy person than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and therefore they used to come and give him their valuables, trusting him that he, in spite of animosity that they have, and in spite of all the differences, still no one is going to take care of it better than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, as we know it, up to that time, even the Quraysh. They have not heard too many statements from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Amana, but after immigration, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started giving the khutbahs in his masjid, we always hear in his khutbah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, La imana liman la amana tala. A person who is not trustworthy, he has no iman. Look at the strength of this statement that is putting amana and iman together trustworthiness and iman and of course what is trustworthiness what is amana many times our understanding of it is very limited that if someone gives me something taking care of it properly is amana but it has much wider understanding from the islamic point of view than what we normally understand of it just as the other word, other title of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-sadiq, the most truthful person. The concept of truthfulness in Islam is much wider and greater than the concept that we normally have in our minds, and that is that a person, when he says something, according to his understanding, he's saying the truth. But this is a very limited understanding of it. Just like a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ كَذِبًا أَنْ يُحَدِّثَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمِعَ A person who keeps on reading everything that he hears about others That person is one of the liars So it has much wider understanding than what we normally understand of it And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with all of those definitions He was al-sadiq and he was al-ameen the most truthful and the most trustworthy person. As, they, as he kept all the trust for people, he left Ali radiallahu anhu behind. And this is one of the great signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being trustworthy. That here all the kuffar are plotting against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And finally they come to the level where they would like to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or ayaz billah. Still, even at that situation, he is not telling them, if you need your trust and you need your belongings, come to me in Medina, I need to talk to you before I give it back to you. How come you didn't stand for me at that time? How come you didn't speak up? How come you didn't say something? Nothing. Ali, stay behind, give all of these people their belongings, and then once you are done with this, then only come to Medina Munawwara. And Ali radiallahu anhu stayed back for three days, and then he left for Medina Munawwara. The second reason for leaving Ali radiallahu anhu behind was he made Ali radiallahu anhu sleep in his bedding. So Ali radiallahu anhu was sleeping at the bed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kuffar throughout the night as they see someone sleeping they thought that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not go out looking for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam till the morning and until they found out that this is not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. To tell us that although Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he left from in between all of those people who were surrounding the house. That was a miracle. But he did not just left everything on miracles and did not just put his trust solely on miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make everything happen miraculously and I don't have to do nothing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used all the means, worldly means that was in his uh, control and whatever he could do in order for him to be able to escape from Makkah Mukarramah, he used those means and he did it just like 
asking Ali radiallahu anhu to sleep on his bed so the kuffar won't look for him at that time and he will have enough space to go and hide somewhere. And then being in the in Ghari Thawr, staying there for three days, all of these are worldly means that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used. So it wasn't just all miracles. Yes, there were some miracles there, but mainly Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam planned everything for himself also. So anyway, three days later, Ali radiallahu anhu arrived in Medina Munawwara. Ibn Ishaq, one of the well-known Muslim historians, narrated a very amazing story regarding something that Ali radiallahu anhu narrates during his stay, something that he had seen during his stay in Quba. He says, when I came to Quba and I stayed there for some days, I started knowing people, so I knew about a house. People introduced a house to me that this house belongs to a widow and there is no man that lives in this house. This is all I knew, of, knew about that house. So he says, normally during the night time when I used to get up and I would walk out, I would see a man coming to the door and handing something in to a woman that lives in the house. So I saw that for a few nights, I went and knocked at the door and I asked that woman, I said to her, you're a Muslim woman, and I know that there is no man that lives with you here. Every night I've been seeing a man that comes and knocks at the door and he hands something to you. What's going on? So she replied that this is Sahal bin Hunayf radiallahu anhu. He was a very well known Sahabi. Every night because he knows my situation, so every night he collects all the wood from the idols that people are breaking because they are becoming Muslim. So they, he collects all the wood from those idols and he comes and he gives those wood to me so I can use it for burning and for uh, cooking things, uh, for putting on the fire. So he's helping me with that. Ali radiallahu anhu says, at that time I realized that in few days after becoming Muslim, what a great change these people are having in their lives, that subhanAllah this person who just became Muslim and now he's taking care of this widow so much that every night he goes around, he collects all of that wood and then he brings all of that to this woman. And of course, later on we learn that it wasn't only this one person there were a lot of Sahaba Ridwanullah including Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu and the other Khulafa during their Khilafah when they are busy and extremely busy in their Khilafah and with the affairs of the Khilafah and they have to control so many things, things are being expanding and a lot of new things are coming up. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have just passed away but you would find Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu night time going to some of the houses where there are blind people, where there are handicapped people and he's cleaning everything for them, he's preparing meals for them, he's handing everything to them that they would need and in the morning these people don't even know who have done all of this work for them during the night time. A man came, all they know, a man came and he did all of this. Some of the people, widows, orphans, they used to find at their doorstep every night, they never knew throughout the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who was doing it until when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away and they didn't find the food anymore, they realized that was Amir al-Mu'mineen who was doing all of that work for them. So, this is at the very beginning step, Ali radiallahu anhu is narrating it about Sahal bin Hunayf radiallahu anhu. Anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during the days that he was in Quba, he decided to build a masjid over there. And that is the masjid that is known as Masjid Quba. Kulthum bin al-Hadam had a land over there where you can call it a storage where he used to keep all the dates for them to dry up and then he would sell them out in the market so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bought that storage from him and started building the masjid at that place that is the first masjid that was built by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we cannot necessarily say it was the first masjid built in the history of Islam because there are some indications of having a masjid in Medina Munawwara not 
at the point where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has his own masjid but some other locality people built a place of worship they built a masjid so that they can get together over there and they perform salah over there initially it was the house of one of the sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in and then finally took the form of a masjid so not necessarily that that was the first masjid ever built in the history of Islam but it was the first masjid built by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or under the supervision of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that was the first masjid where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam led salah with jama'a and he established the jama'a continuously over there yes in Makkah Mukarramah around the Kaaba he may have secretly done one or two prayers but we cannot say he established it as a masjid but here this was the place where he established it as a masjid and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this masjid in Quran al-Kareem la masjidun ussisa ala taqwa min awwali yawm ahaqqu an taquma feeh feeh rijalu yuhibbuna yitatahharu wallahu yuhibbu al-muttahirin that the masjid that was founded on taqwa ussisa ala taqwa min awwali yawm from the very first day it was founded on taqwa it was not that they dis- they were going to build something else they thought of bringing haram and haram earnings or things like this and then the later on they changed their mind from the very first day the masjid was built on taqwa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam these are the type of masajid where you should pray and where you should go to pray fihi rijalu yuhibbuna yatatahharu in that masjid which means in Quba there are people who like to stay pure and clean and Allah likes pure and clean people one of the Sahabiya whose name was Shamus she narrates as uh, Imam Tabrani rahmatullahi alayhi have narrated with an authentic sanad she says when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was building that masjid he was helping the Sahaba Ridwanullah al-Majma'een and he was doing all the work with Sahaba Ridwanullah al-Majma'een so I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa carrying some heavy rocks and bringing it to the place of the masjid so on his way Sahaba Ridwanullah al-Majma'een would approach Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him to give that, those heavy weights to them so that they can carry it and uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would not have to do all of that work but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would tell them that go and bring it from where I brought it go to the mountain where we are breaking the mountain and taking the rocks and go over there and bring another one for yourself maybe a practical lesson for us and therefore I would just mention something that I just remembered I remember when we were students there was a teacher in our school Sometimes, when that teacher would see that we are getting a little lazy with cleanliness, so he would go and start cleaning, he would take a broom and he would start cleaning one of the rooms. Now, of course, as students, you know, you cannot see your teacher cleaning and you are not doing helping him, you know, helping him. And you can't just even turn your face and go away as you haven't seen him. It's, it's disrespect. So, we would go to him and offer him that we would do the work. He says, you know, there is another broom there, and the next room needs to, clean, needs to be cleaned also. So here, one person comes, is cleaning the next room. The second person comes, he will give him another broom. Go, there is another room, next door room, that needs to be cleaned also. And just in that manner, he would get the whole thing clean in no time. And that is practically doing it himself. The reason I mentioned this is something that I have seen it myself. When a person does the work himself, how it affects others around him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he wanted to do something, and he wanted to get something done, he always did it himself. And Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam, when they saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing it, they would of course not stay behind and they would try to help. And as this incident tells us, that when they go and ask him, they offer him to carry that, uh, those rocks, for him, he says, no, we need even more, so go and bring another one from there. Why would you want to take it from me? So, this is how he was teaching Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een how to be active in the work and how everyone should take part in these type of work. In fact, 
Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een at that time and mainly this poem is narrated about when he was building his own masjid they used to say لَإِن قَعَدْنَا وَالرَّسُولُ يَعْمَلْ لَذَاكَ مِنَّ الْعَمَلُ الْمُضْلِلُ If we sit while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is working then of course we are going in a wrong direction so now when they see him working no one would be sitting down and no one would just run away no one would just uh, go and have rest and uh, thinking that okay now I'm tired the others are working no, as long as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is working, I'll keep on working. And this is what gave Sahaba Rizwanullah al-Majmain a lot of encouragement to do all of that work. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built that masjid. And as I mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed in Quba for about 14 days. During his stay in Quba, <coughs> All the Sahaba and all the people they used to come and meet with it, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. People who were interested about Islam, they would come and see Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, asking questions of, uh, about Islam. During that time, a person came whose name was Maba. He was from Persia. He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he offered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam something saying, Ya Rasulullah, this is a sadaqah. And now he just sat on a distance watching Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what he would do with the sadaqah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called some of the poor sahaba rizwanullah alayhi and he said to them here, this came to us as a sadaqah, take it and eat it. And he did not use none of that. He just gave a whole, the whole thing to, sahab, to the poor Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa This person left. He came the next day. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, he offers him some dates now. Ya Rasulullah, this is hadiyah from me, a gift. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ate some of those dates and then he shared it with the rest of the other Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa that were sitting around and Maba is sitting on a distance, is watching. Now when he saw this, he gets up and he's going around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as if he's looking for something. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew what he is looking for. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam removed his sheet from his back and he says to him, now you can see it. So this person goes behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's back and he kisses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa back between the shoulders because there between the shoulders there was something called the seal of the prophethood. It was a piece of flesh in the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa between the shoulders that was mentioned in all the previous books that the last prophet and messenger of Allah that would come this will be the seal of the prophethood on his back. So the people of the previous books, who had any knowledge of the previous books, they knew that this last messenger of Allah would be recognized by that seal. So they used to come and see that at that piece of flesh in the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and of course it was exactly as per the description mentioned in Torah and in Jil and in the other books, whatever they knew about. So they knew that he is the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam and that is the reason with many others this is one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Those to whom we have given a book, previous books they recognize him the way they recognize their own children they have no doubt about him being a messenger of Allah When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed him that seal of the Prophet or he saw it and he was satisfied, now he said, he said in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him about his story, that how did you come to Medina? Tell me details about your life and how did you learn about these signs of, of prophethood? So Maba went into his details to explain, he says, I was born in Persia, Iran. And my father was a very wealthy man over there. 
I was the only son. My father loved me so much that he would always keep me at home. He would always keep me at home. And as soon as he would come home, he would be just being or uh, keep me around him and he would just keep me. He would always, he would, the satisfaction of his heart was just seeing me. One day as I grew up, and still he keeps me at home. So one day he wasn't able to go to work. He had gardens and he had farms that he used to take care of. So he asked me to go and take care of some of the business over there. On my way, I was passing by a place of worship. When I saw people offering some worship, I loved that way of worship. We used, we used to worship fire. And in my house, I was the caretaker of that fire, making sure the fire never goes off because according to our understanding that was God and if you let it go off then God gets very upset he says when I saw that way of worship I said to myself this seems to be more logical it seems that this is the right way of life whatever worships we are offering it makes no sense and especially bowing down before a fire so I spent the whole day at that place watching these people offering the worship and then I approached the person who was leading them and I asked him questions about that religion and he told me that we believe in the prophethood of Isa alayhi salatu was salam he was the last messenger of Allah and we have a book called Injil and we try to follow the instructions given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book and whatever we have learned from Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam he said, when I went home, my father asked me, where were you the whole day? I told him that I was at that place of worship, and it was very interesting, so I just stood over there, watching it. He said, I never knew that this statement of mine will just turn everything over, because I was just looking at my lo the love of my father for me, and uh, the way he treated me throughout my life, I never thought that I can ever see him being upset with me or doing anything to me that I would uh, that would be harmful to me. But as soon as I said those words, he chained me in the house with the fear that someday I may turn away from this religion. And he said to me that whatever religion we are following, this is the only religion you are allowed to follow, this is the only religion you are supposed to follow, and you are not supposed to look at any other way of life. So he said, finally one day I was able to send a message to that person, to the leader who was leading uh, the prayers in the place of worship, really I'm um, avoiding some of the common words that are used for it, which is priest or a church, because those were the people at that time, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, it, it was the time of the Nabuwa of Isa alayhi salatu was salam. And people were supposed to follow Isa alayhi salatu was salam because he was the last prophet up to that time before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And their ways of worship, their ibadah, everything was Islam, was, it was the deen that was acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was in fact uh, demanded from people that, that this is the way of life they should be following. So, he sent him a message that if at any time there are people going to Sham because Syria was known to be the center for uh, learned uh, religious uh, people who follow the deen of Isa alayhi salatu was salam. So, if any group of people is at any time going to Syria over there to Sham, please let me know because I would like to join them and I would like to learn the deen of Isa alayhi salatu was salam. So one day he sent him a message that tomorrow morning, early morning, we are having a group of people that are leaving for Sham. If you would like to join them, just come any time during the night time before the morning break because early morning they will be leaving. So he said, somehow I managed to escape from there night time and I joined that group and I left my country to Sham. When I went in Sham, I looked for the most learned person, the person that was known to be the most learned over there in that religion and I started spending time with that man. 
Isa is I st as a st uh, uh, status staying close to this man, I realize that this man is teaching people, but when it comes to practice, whenever he gets the sadaqat, he does not give them out, out to the poor people. He keeps all the sadaqat, and in fact, he has a room where he has underground tunnel type of thing, where he used to bury all of the gold and silver and all the other valuables that he would get in sadaqat. During his lifetime, I was not able to speak a word about him because of his power. After he died, I told people of what he was doing. They went over there to see that he really had gathered a lot of uh, jewelries and a lot of gold and silver, a lot of uh, wealth over there. The person who came and who was assigned as a leader after him, he was a very religious person and a person who was really truly follower of the book and he was <coughs> doing his best to follow the teachings of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam. He said I stayed with him for some time. When his last time came before he died, I asked him that what should I do after you? Because I trust you now, I'm attached to you, so you may know someone who is very learned and at the same time practicing of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell me who would be who should be that person so that I can go and spend my time with that person so he said to me that there is a place in Iraq called Musil go over there and spend your time with the person and he gave me the name of the person go and spend your time with that man he's a very knowledgeable and at the same time very pious man I went over there I spent my time with that man when that person was dying I asked him to tell me give, me, uh, uh, give me some instructions about what should do I, I do after him and who should I go and spend my time with after him so he said to me that there is another person in Nasibin a place, a town called Nasibin he sent me to that man after some time even that well, learned person, that pious man of Nasibin he, was, he also died and he asked me to go and spend time with another very virtuous man who was living in a place called Amuriya. He said, I spent a, lo a long time in Amuriya. After that, af after a long time when that person was also dying, I asked him, I gave him my whole history and I told him, what, sh I, what should I do after you? He said to me, as far as my knowledge is concerned, I don't know if anyone is really practicing the true deen now. People have made a lot of changes and they are continuously making changes in the book. And according to my knowledge of our book, this is almost the time of the last Prophet of Allah to come. And he gave me some signs of the place where he would be coming and he said, that place is in Arabia for sure. So after he died, I decided I would go to Arabia and then I would look for a place with this description that he has given me in the light of Torah and Injil. After he died, I started looking for people that I can join who would take me to Arabia. And of course, there were a lot of trade car wars that used to come from Arabia to this side of the world, to Syria and Iraq and those places. So he said, I, I was looking for them so I can join one of them. And finally I found a clan called Bani Kalab, well-known clan of, Ar of Arabs. So when I found those people, I asked them if I can join them back to Arabia. I had a lot of goats that I have gathered over there at that time as I was working there. So I offered them all of my wealth. I said, all I need is just take me to Arabia and then I will get settled over there I will find something for myself over there so they took everything he had and he gave everything he had to those people just so that he can join them until he will get to Arabia amazing look at this man's sacrifice this Maba who have left his hometown he left everything that was there just because he's searching for the truth and he's searching for the true deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he wants to live his life as a true follower 
of the deen of Allah and he wants to, he would like to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he gave everything earlier he gave his family he gave his house he gave all the status he had in his town and now he ends up being over here from one town to another to third to fourth and now he even gives everything he have acquired during this time and he is joining that clan but subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own plans how things work many times we don't understand but of course we should always trust Allah's plan and whatever happens we do our best but if we see the results are against what we were trying just put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qada and qadr destiny whatever Allah have destined for us inshallah it will be good for us these people as they were going there to Arabia they, were, they, they never lived in Mecca or Medina they used to live far from there on their way they met a group of Jews that were from Medina Munawara so now they thought we have this man with us this young man with us and there is no reason that we cannot make some money out of him so they approached those Jews and asked them we have a slave would you like to buy him I said sure okay they bring a rock and put it in the neck of Salman radiallahu anhu hand over the rock to one of the Jews there here this is my slave would you like to bring this is the price for it and that Jew liked the slave he sees him very wise and seen, uh, he sees everything good in him so he buys Salman radiallahu anhu and subhanallah now Salman radiallahu anhu from being in a house of that wealthy man in hand the house of one of the governors of one of the superpowers of that time he ends up being a slave but the amazing part is when he arrived at the town of that Jew who bought him who bought Salman radiallahu anhu he realizes that it exactly fits the description that that person had told him about the town where the last prophet is going to come and that was Medina Munawara Salman radiallahu anhu ended being in Medina Munawara but now as a slave and as he kept on working as a slave he had no choice now he's living a life of slavery one day as he is working and he goes he's, he was up on a tree breaking some of the dates and passing it down to the owner a cousin of his, the owner of his owner comes over there and he says to him look that prophet that these Arabs are waiting for he's already there he's in Quba sitting there and they are discussing it as soon as he heard it he came down and he asked him what did you say so the owner they don't want him to join them in this conversation he got upset he slaps him he says go back to your work <coughs> mind on your, your business you don't have to worry about this so he goes back, goes back to work but he knows in the evenings as soon as he's done with the work this is the first thing he has to do this is what he has been looking for for a long time he has to go and see that man so in the evening he went over there he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sitting over there the last person who told him about the place where this last prophet is going to come he also told him three descriptions by which he should recognize that prophet number one that prophet will not eat the sadaqah number two when he will get the hadiyah he will use it number three he has the seal of the prophethood so this Maba whose name was Maba he comes he sees all of these signs and then finally he says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I'm satisfied that you are the Prophet of Allah, you are the last messenger of Allah and he took his, he, he took his shahada and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam changed his name from Maba to Salman radiallahu anhu then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for Salman radiallahu anhu that he was he was also able to pay the ransom to his master and be free from the slavery and he lived as a, a free man Salman radiallahu anhu is a sahabi who lived 60 years 
before Islam, 60 years in Islam. When he passed away, he was about 120 years old. So he spent 60 years, we can say he was about, from the histories, we can say he was about 15, 16 years old when he left his hometown. Rest of the time, he was just going around searching for the truth and looking for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, look what the effort would do. That his effort and in spite of living a life of slavery, he accepted all of that. Whatever hardships, any situation, any difficulties he had to face in his way of searching for truth, he accepted all of that very willingly as long as he can find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and follow the deen of Allah and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to the right place at the right time. And he came, he became one of the great Sahaba Ridwan and he was known. And he's known as one of the very wise Sahaba Ridwan during the Battle of Khandaq. The trenches that were dug, dug around the around Medina Munawwara, they they were done uh, according to the opinion of Salman radiallahu anhu. And he is the Sahabi about oh, very famous hadith is narrated that some kuffar objected لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلَّ شَيْنْ حَتَّى الْخِرْعَةِ Your Prophet teaches you everything, even how to use the bathroom and instead of getting angry, very gentle and he was very wise at a time when a normal person would get angry he used to use those situations and through his wisdom he would control the situation in such a way that those who are accusing and those who are just blaming and those who are just trying to find faults he will make them think of what the right thing is and many times they would just come into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he says to those people yes our prophet taught us those things but do you know why? because these are the things that we need to learn and now he teaches them some more teachings beautiful teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about just about using the bathroom things that he knew that these people are not practicing and things that every normal person would consider being very hygiene very uh, normal very clean and things that will be applicable to a normal person to a person a person with good understanding will always appreciate those teachings so this is how he used to preach the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Salman radiallahu anhu became Muslim during the same time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Quba. Anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after spending 14 days in Quba, then he left for Medina Munawwara. At that time, Quba was outside of Medina. That it was considered three miles away from Medina Munawwara. But now, it's part of Medina Munawwara. Therefore, many times when we read those words of the history that he immigrated then he went from Quba to Medina it seems that it's the same thing but in those days it was not the same thing Medina was a small town in fact nowadays if anyone have seen the recent Haram the whole Medina during that time was only this much as much as the Haram nowadays so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Jum'ah he left for Medina Munawwara from Quba. The people of Quba <coughs> the people of Quba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to live there for hours and just to station over there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me to Medina Munawwara. This was only I wanted to station here for some time so that I can settle other things that I need to settle and now it's my time to go to Medina Munawwara. On the day of Jum'ah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left for Medina Munawwara. When he was at a place in, uh, called Bani Salim, it was a neighborhood called Bani Salim. It was the time of Jum'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Salat al-Jum'ah in an open land over there. Now, there is a masjid over there called Masjid al-Jum'ah. Anyone that goes to Medina Munawwara, you see that masjid is not too far from Masjid Quba but it's between there and the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam masjid called Masjid al-Jumu'ah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Salat al-Jumu'ah at that place that was the first Jumu'ah ever led by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the history of Islam but we should not confuse it this was not the first Jumu'ah performed in Islam 
it was the first Jum'ah led by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or first Jum'ah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had never performed Salatul Jum'ah before that, but Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam used to perform Salatul Jum'ah even before that. As we know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent Mus'ab bin Umayr radiyallahu anhu to Medina Munawwara to teach people the deen and to preach Islam. So, in Medina Munawwara, Mus'ab bin Umayr radiyallahu anhu used to lead Salat al-Jum'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him a message that on the day of Jum'ah you should get together and perform this prayer in this manner. So he taught them how to do it and Mus'ab bin Umayr radiyallahu anhu used to lead Salat al-Jum'ah in Medina Munawwara before the Hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the house of As'ad bin Zurara radiyallahu anhu. The reason I mention this because there are some ahadith that say the first person who led the salah, salat al-jum'ah was As'ad bin Zurara. It was in the house of As'ad bin Zurara since he was the host. Mus'ad bin Umair is one of the muhajireen. He came from Mecca. So as, Mus'ab, as As'ad bin Zurara is inviting people for Jum'ah, so people are saying that first Jum'ah we did was behind As'ad bin Zurara, but it was really on the invitation of As'ad bin, As'ad bin Zurara in the house of As'ad bin Zurara, but it was led by Mus'ab bin Umair radiallahu anhu because he was the Imam, you can say, for the people of Medina Munawwara, and he is the one who really preached Islam in Medina Munawwara, and most of the people embraced Islam, they came to this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the teachings and the invitation of Mus'ab bin Umayr radiallahu anhu. With this detail now we know that Jum'ah became fard in Islam before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immigrated to Medina Munawwara, before his hijrah. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not perform Salat al-Jum'ah in Makkah Mukarramah because Mecca was Darul Harq. They were not allowed to perform these prayers openly. They were not allowed to have their masjid over there. They were not allowed to establish prayers over there in Jama'ah. They used to do it secretly. So, Darul Harq, and from this we know that it's not far for people in Darul Harq to perform the Jama'ah because they are not allowed. But at the same time, when some people try to say at different parts of the world, they try to issue a fatwa that that place is Darul Harb. Remember, the ruling about Darul Harb is that Hijrah is far from there. So before we make that decision, we have to look at the whole picture of it. And if that is the real decision, and if anyone feels about any country that that is Darul Harb, then for that person to live in that country is not allowed. Hijrah becomes far from Darul Harb. So. Makkah Mukarramah was Darul Harb. They were not allowed to establish Islam over there. They were not allowed to establish prayers. They were not allowed to have masjid over there. So, therefore, the Sharia, the Ahkam of the Sharia, were not established over there. But Hijrah was far from there. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to Medina Munawwara. But the other question, and a very important question that comes up, is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we just talked about, he lived in Quba for 14 days and he built a masjid also there. Then how come this was his first Jum'ah? Why not in Quba? The reason for that was because Quba was a small village. It was a very small village, such a small village that if these people, most of their needs were not fulfilled within the town, they had to come to Medina to get their needs fulfilled like market and buying some of the things yes normal food items they would get it in Quba but most of the bigger things they used to have to come to Medina Munawara for it so Quba was a very small village and Jum'ah cannot be established in that type of small villages and therefore Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not perform Salat al-Jum'ah in Quba and even after he built the masjid over there, he came to Medina Munawwara. He started establishing Salat al Jum'ah in his masjid in Medina Munawwara. The people of Quba never performed Salat al Jum'ah in Quba. The hadith is in Sahih al Bukhari. 
اول جمعة جمعت بعد مسجد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جمعة بجواسة قرية من البحرين that the first Jum'ah that was established in a masjid after the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in any place. The first Jum'ah that was performed in the history of Islam after the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was in a town called Juwasa in Bahrain. So in Bahrain, in a town called Juwasa, was the first place where Salat al-Jum'ah was established after the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, that point of performing Salat al-Jum'ah led us to this detail that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he arrived Medina Munawwara in, uh, on, on the day of Jum'ah and in the place of Bani Salama, in the town of Bani Salama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Salat al-Jum'ah and then he continued. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished the Salah and he started continuing his journey because he himself doesn't know where he's going to station now. That is something that will be decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's continuing his journey, but at the same time he knows that there is someone in Medina Munawwara who is very upset. Who is very upset because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa arrival in Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sa- thought to himself, instead of just keeping him upset, why not paying him a visit, pay him a visit? And if I just go and visit him, then this person will feel that, he, uh, that I have given him some respect and uh, I did whatever I could do for him. So uh, let me go and just see this person visit him. He went to visit that man. And I'm sure if you have studied the history and the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you could figure who that man was, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who later on was known as Ra'is al-Munafiqeen, the leader of all the Munafiqeen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to visit him. He said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, اذهب إلى الذين دعوك. Go and visit those who have invited you and be with those people. Why are you here for? Amazingly, everyone wanted to invite Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they were feeling honored if he would accept their invitation. And this man, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is going to him to visit him and he is rejecting to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiyallahu anhu was there. He said, Ya Rasulullah, please don't be upset with what he have told you. And then he present the reason why he's doing this. He says, Ya Rasulullah, the people of Medina were going to choose him to be the king of Medina because they had wars for a long time. And finally they came to the decision why not have one person who would be the king for at least the Arabs in Medina, in Medina Munawwara and around it. So they chose Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul to be the king and it still was, uh, the thing was still in process before things would finalize they heard that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have decided that he is going to immigrate to Medina Munawwara. So they kept on postponing it until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and then that by the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it was decided that who would be the leader there. Of course this man could not take that, that someone else will be taking his position. So that was the reason that he, why he was upset with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and throughout his life he lived as a life of munafiqeen life of a munafiq always opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa opposing the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much so that finally when he died Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayahs of Al-Quran al-Kareem telling everyone 
about this person's kufr and about this person going to Jahannam al billah He spent his whole life just opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he did so many things, such things, he went so low in his behavior, in his attitude, in opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he would even sometime openly be sitting in gatherings and talking against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wives, against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa daughters, and just making accusation to them, making false accusations and blames on these, uh, on Ummahat al Mu'mineen, on the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, for a person, for any, any normal person, this is unbearable, but of course, imagine how much it would how much it would be hurting the feelings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always try to say a good word about this man anyway as we when we uh, when we talk about the seerah I made it a point that we talk about fiqh seerah also understanding the points of the seerah and getting our lessons from the seerah here we learn this very important lesson from the seer, from the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the thing that kept this man away from hidayah, from following the truth, was only because he lost his leadership. He wanted a position. In simple word, we may call it arrogance. Or oh, I was supposed to be in that position. Who is he to come and take my place? Who is he to come and take my position? And a lot of time, a lot of time you will find that this is the reason why people always stay away from the Hidayah. Am I going to learn from this man? No, never. I'm not going to learn from him. Who is this man to be considered my teacher? Who is this man to be considered my elder? Who is this man that I would respect him? He should come and respect me. He should come and do this for me. He should to do this about for me and these type of behavior that normally keep people away and deprive people from following the hidayah and from learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if people at that time looked at their age some of the people were older than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam when people like him they looked at their status that before coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam they were supposed to be the kings now that position is gone so of course now they are killing carrying grudge against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, jealousy against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is depriving them from following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in spite of having Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst them. The reason I'm mentioning this point, we need to really even look at ourselves that many times we ourselves we may fall into that type of situation that what I'm going to do? I'm the Imam in this masjid. Here this person comes. I know he's more learned than me. I know he's better than me. But if I would say that to people, if I would let people know, then people would tell me, okay, we are going to learn it from him. Why should we learn it from you? So in order to keep my position, I will always to keep the try. I will try my best to keep that person down. This is depriving myself, depriving others from learning the Deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And the reason for that, it's only position and that arrogance, that jealousy, that hatred that we normally carry in our hearts. That I don't want anyone else to take my position. Why would this person come and take over? This is why when some of the scholars of Islam were asked, what is ikhlas in amal? What is ikhlas in doing any work of deen? He said ikhlas, the sign of ikhlas is simply that you should always be ready when you find a person better than you to do that work, hand over all of that work to him no matter how much you have done for it. It's not easy. But of course, this is ikhlas. So, this was the thing when a person did not have that, he did not want to give up that, posi- give up that position, then he was deprived from the deen, he was deprived from 
being a Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Otherwise, had he accepted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's teachings and accepted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as his prophet, as his imam, as his leader, he would have been the leader of the ummah now, just like other Sahaba radhiyallahu alayhi majma'in. Anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as it was you know, his normal situation, his normal habit, whenever anyone would say anything about him, he would just ignore it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued going. Whenever he would pass by any of the neighborhoods, those people would try to stop Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's camel, and they would beg Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to station at their, in their place, in their neighborhood, and they all, in fact, their leaders will be offering Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam their houses and everything that they have. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's reply was always, Da'uha fa innaha ma'mura. Just leave my camel alone because this camel is ordered by Allah. The camel knows where to go, so it's going according by itself. I'm not guiding the camel. I'm not telling the camel what to, where to go. I'm not doing anything. As you can see, that the camel is just traveling by itself. Da'uha fa'innaha ma'mura. Let it go. This camel is ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continued going. The hadith is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. Bara' bin Azib radiyallahu anhu says, I have never seen the people of Medina being so happy with anything as much as they were happy on the day when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina Munawwara. And everyone was hoping that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would take their hafs. Subhanallah. If not, he would just live with them. He would just take their hafs. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying, No, I'm not going to accept none of these. Let my camel decide. Allah is deciding it. And my camel will station wherever it has to station. Another hadith rated by... Anas radiyallahu anhu in Ibn Majah, he says, the day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Medina Munawwara, aba'a minha kull shayi. Everything was lightened in Medina Munawwara. We were physically be able to, were able to see light in everything. Even in the dust of Medina, we were able to see a lot of light. These are the people who saw the change. So, of course, what can be greater than having Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says Aba'a minha kull shayi Another hadith rated by Abu Khaytham radiyallahu anhu he says I was there the day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Medina Munawwara falam ara yawman ahsana minh wala adwa I have never seen a better and more bright day than the day when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Medina Munawwara and this is the reason that town is called Al Munawwara because everything was munawar, nur, there was nur in everything as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came into that town. Surprisingly, I heard some people nowadays are saying that calling it, calling Medina is, uh, uh, Munawara is bid'ah. It happened with me once I went to a place and some young people came after that they said, Oh, we heard you are from Medina. Yes. From which Medina? Are you from Medina to Rasul or from Medina Munawwara? I said, What? Which Medina are you from? From Medina to Rasul or Medina Munawwara? So I said to them, I don't know the difference. Tell me the difference, I'll tell you where I'm from. So they said, Medina to Rasul is the town where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was. But calling it Medina Munawwara, our Sheikh said, is bid'ah. Because your Sheikh doesn't know the Hadith. Oh, our Sheikh knew all the Hadith. SubhanAllah. Then why would he call it bid'ah? So I said to them, you know, what's the name of the country that we are living in? I said, America. I said, it's bid'ah. I don't find no Hadith calling it America. If really this is what bid'ah is, then even you are bid'ah. Because I don't see your name in the hadith. Sheikh is Everything will be bid'ah. So, then I said to them, Anas, this hadith of Anas radiallahu anhu, that Anas radiallahu says, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, 
Everything was lightened up. There was noor in everything that we saw. This is Munawara. This is what Munawara means. So it is in the hadith that everything was had light in it. Everything had a noor in it. So anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was the day when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived. And it was the happiest day for the people of Medina Munawara. And that was the time when the young girls came out and started singing Tala al Badru alayna min saniyat al wada wajab al shukru alayna ma da'a lillahi da'a ayyuha al mab'uthu fina jitta bil amr al muta' jitta sharrafta al madina marhaban ya khayra da'a which means that the moon have appeared in our town from the mountains of al wada' because he came from that side and it is obligatory on us to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as long as there is a living being out of us as long as we will pray to Allah as long as we are in this world and we will pray to Allah we will be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came to our town anyway Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's camel kept on continuing with its journey until it is stationed at a place where nowadays we see the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and right away a sahabi with the name Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said Ya Rasulullah my door is the closest to this place so now you're going to be stationing at my house Ya Rasulullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said sure if your house is the closest then I will be stationing at your house Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu inshallah we will continue from here on of what happened in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu situation of the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu then building of the masjid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moving out of the house of Abu Ayyub radiyallahu anhu inshallah we will continue from there in our next session aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Earlier you were making the mention of uh, how the Prophet Islam, he um, did as much as he could as far as his worldly means and then he put his tawakkul on Allah and uh, in this regard uh, is this a hadith that I've heard and if it's a hadith is it is it maqbul where it mentions to uh, put your trust in Allah and tie a camel also is that a hadith or just, is that just a saying or it is a hadith where a person came and asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya Rasulullah if I go to the masjid and I want to perform a prayer should I tie my camel and put my trust in Allah or should I keep it loose and put my trust in Allah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Aqilha wa tawakkal Tie your camel and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Although some scholars considered this hadith as wick and they said it might be a saying of a sahabi who is narrator of the hadith, not the saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wallahu alayhi wa sallam. I think it's only basically uh, the difference of understanding the point and that is as far as if a person will say oh don't you have no trust in Allah before you tie it 
So of course we all have to have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we tithe if this is what he meant, whatever who was we talking. But normally n- the one where the word tawakkul is used when it comes to results that we don't know what the results are going to be. So should we cry for the results? Should we panic? Should we complain if they are not in our favor? This is what it means that do whatever you can and then for the result, whatever the result comes, then put that your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah it will be the best for you even if there is something that you don't like to see. You talked about the three indications of Hudu Sallallahu in the Bible. So do they still exist in the Bible or are they being taken out? These three uh, signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that we talked about are they still existing in Bible? I have not heard about it from the recent scholars or anyone that talks about that field I haven't heard it from, uh, from them about these signs. What was one of the signs? He would not eat the sadaqah, he will not use the sadaqah for himself. The second one was that if it is hadiyah then he will use it for himself, he will accept the hadiyah and he will use it. And third one was that he has that uh, sign, uh, the seal of the Prophet on his back. Uh, what did the seal look like? Mm-hmm. The seal. How did it look like? You can say almost half an egg. It was a raised piece of flesh, just like half of an egg, as we see, but not a normal egg, egg of a small bird. Mm-hmm. 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 From birth. It was from birth. 